the Bolsheviks come to power uh, by Alexander Rabinowitch. Chapter 4, The Ineffectiveness of Repression. Viewing the apparent swing in sentiment against the Bolsheviks and the seemingly decisive steps taken by the provisional government to restore order in the immediate wake of the July uprising, many contemporary observers were inclined to believe, wishfully no doubt, that the Bolsheviks had incurred a fatal defeat. As one newspaper editor wrote confidently at the time, the Bolsheviks are compromised, discredited, and crushed. More than that, they have been expelled from Russian life. Their teaching has turned out to be an irreversible failure and has scandalized itself and its believers before the world and for all time. And as another writer, a cadet, put it, the Bolsheviks are hopelessly compromised. Bolshevism has died a sudden death. It has turned out to be a bluff inflated with Germany money. With the benefit of hindsight, one can see that those who facilely, facilely wrote off Bolshevism as a potent political force in the midsummer of 1917 failed completely to take account of the basic concerns and great potential power of the Petrograd masses and of the enormous attraction that a revolutionary political and social program like that of the Bolsheviks held for them. At the same time, such people were obviously misled by the torrent of tough-sounding decrees emanating from, from the Winter Palace. They read into the actions of the provisional government a singleness of purpose and degree of strength and effectiveness that it simply did not possess. Kerensky's flaming hardline rhetoric not, notwithstanding Almost none of the major repressive measures adopted by the cabinet during this period either was fully implemented or successfully achieved its objectives. The policy of getting arms and ammunition out of the hands of civilians, for example, encountered early obstacles and was not pursued for long. Similarly, similarly only the 1st Machine Gun Regiment, the 180th Infantry Regiment, and the Grenadier Regiment among the many units of the Petrograd garrison in which Bolsheviks had a strong foothold, were effectively disarmed. While considerable numbers of personnel from radicalized units were transferred to the front in late July and August, none of these units, contrary to the original intention, were completely liquidated. As for the government's avowed aim of arresting and quickly bringing to trial leaders and supporters of the July insurrection, although many Bolsheviks were jailed after, after the re rebellion's collapse, most of the Petrograd party organization's roughly 32,000 members were not disturbed by the authorities. Those leftists actually jailed were not formally indicated or indicted for some time, if at all and the October Revolution intervened before any of them were brought to trial. Various factors contributed to this state of affairs. The provisional government's fundamental weakness and lack of credibility among the, civilian, among the masses were probably the main reasons for its lack of success in disarming civilians. The official justification for requisition, requisitioning weapons was that soldiers under attack at the front badly needed them. Actually, the government's main concern in taking this action was to lessen the danger of renewed civil strife by confiscating handguns, rifles, and machine guns, which workers had acquired during the February dates and which they had used in July to terrorize the government and the Soviet. The Central Soviet organs endorsed this effort, but most factory workers, suspicious of the government's intentions and alarmed over what they perceived to be the mounting danger of counter-revolution, would have none of it. Although some civilians obediently turned in weapons immediately after publication of government orders to this effect, it soon became apparent that most workers possessing arms were unwilling to surrender them peacefully. Government troops consequently raided factories and offices of leftist supporters, in which arms were believed to be hidden. More often than not, these fishing expeditions failed to turn up weapons, and they were discontinued toward the end of July. 
Their main result was to exacerbate relations between factory workers and the authorities. That many strongly Bolshevik-influenced military units managed to avoid, disar avoid disarmament was probably partly a result of the fact that they publicly repudiated their previous behavior and adopted fervent pledges of loyalty to the new Kerensky regime as soon as the latter's plans concerning the garrison became known. That the government's plan of transferring Bolshevized troops out of the capital was only partially realized was in part because front commanders had headaches enough, as it was, and were understandably reluctant to accept such unreliable reinforcements. Additionally, making a fair determination of which troops among the 215,000 to 300,000 soldiers of the Petrograd garrison actually deserved to be punished by shipment to the front was no easy matter. Even in the most belligerent reg regiments, only a very small proportion of soldiers had consciously acted to overthrow the government in July. The command of the Petrograd military district was disorganized, and inevitably many largely blameless units were summar sum summarily punished by shipment out of the capital while some troops that had mutinied in July were still in Petrograd in October. The fact that only a small percentage of Bolshevik leaders were arrested after the July days was due partly to the All-Russian Executive Committee's stubborn insistence that action be taken only against individuals, not against whole political groups. Of course, the provisional government did not contain any Kavignaks. This was in part because cabinet ministers were justifiably apprehensive about the government's ability to control the massive protest that an officially sponsored indiscriminate attack on the left was bound to stimulate. To be sure, at the height of the reaction that followed the July days, some leftist institutions were subjected to military attack. Present-day Soviet historians view these assaults as part of a deliberate, all-out campaign by the government to crush the entire Bolshevik organization and the militant labor movement generally. Yet this interpretation does not withstand careful scrutiny. When each of the major post-July military attacks on the left is examined closely, one finds that with a few exceptions, among the most prominent of which were the government's raids on the Shezinskaya mansion and the offices of Pravda, this or that attack on a district Bolshevik committee or non-party labor organization or factory either was directly connected to government attempts to confiscate weapons, or was undertaken at the initiative of some zealous, anonymous second-level official, often a holdover from the Tsarist regime, without the approval of higher authorities. This was the case with the July 9th raid on Bolshevik headquarters in the downtown Litany district. Several days before this attack, the Litany district committee had unwittingly moved into new quarters in a building also housing a regional counterintelligence office. As far as the personnel in this office were concerned, every Bolshevik was a German agent. Acting on their own, they picked the next Sunday to forcibly evict their new neighbors. Similarly, the same day's raid on Bolshevik party headquarters in the Petrograd district, which ended with the wrecking of a neighboring Menshevik office, was initiated and led by junior officers attached to the Petrograd military district. Probing by reporters later revealed that the attack force did not have a warrant, and spokesmen for the government and even General Polovtsev himself denied prior knowledge of the operation. Raids in the suburb of Sestroretsk at this time were also apparently the result of an excess of zeal on the part of lower-level military personnel. When members of a local hunting club at Sestroretsk took some pot shots at camp camping soldiers. The soldiers jumped to the conclusion that factory workers were responsible and reported as much to the headquarters of the Petrograd military district. General Polotsev responded by ordering his troops to disarm some worker detachments known to exist in the Sestroretsk factory. Although this occurred before publication of the provisional government's orders regarding the turning in of weapons, the commander of the force sent to the Sestroretsk factory announced that all weapons in the hands of civilians 
regardless of whether or not they belonged to the worker detachments, were to be confiscated. Moreover, despite the fact that large quantities of arms and ammunition were turned in, government troops arrested seven leftist organizers and searched and wrecked scores of private apartments and labor organization offices in the town of Sestroretsk itself. Evidently, because General Polotsev could not or more likely would not control the frequent excesses of his subordinates, he was, he was relieved of command at the Central Executive Committee's insistence on July 13th. Why it took so long to indict Bolsheviks arrested after the July uprising and why not one was tried are complex question. And why not one was tried are complex questions. There is, first of all, the problem of why the government did not actively prosecute cases in connection with the German agent charges. Several related factors may have been responsible for this. Though it is now evident that funds from German sources were funneled to the Bolsheviks during the revolutionary period, we know that at the time of the July uprising, the government's case was far from complete. Then, too, Lenin, the central figure in the alleged conspiracy, was never caught. Many of those arrested after the July days were picked up and imprisoned merely for a loose word. Prosecuting them would have led only to embarrassment for the government. Charges of complicity in organizing an insurrection leveled against many jailed lower-level Bolshevik leaders, particularly those from the military organization, were based on, on significantly more solid grounds. Published portions of the official inquiry into the background and development of the July uprising indicate that the government had gathered a good deal of persuasive evidence of the significant role played played by activists from the military organization the Petersburg Committee in its organization and expansion. Why some of these people were not speedily brought to trial is a real puzzle. Part of the explanation may be that their cases became swamped among the many more altogether flimsy ones being pursued at the same time. In addition, many of those Bolsheviks whose important roles in organizing the July uprising could be established most definitely were also accused of the much more difficult to substantiate charge of having conspired with the Germans. No doubt this affected the disposition of their cases. More fundamentally, what the available evidence reveals most clearly is that the harassed provisional government, only five months old, was simply ill-equipped to deal effectively with a judicial problem of this nature and magnitude. In the aftermath of the February days, institutions and procedures had been established to investigate and prosecute officials of the old regime. Not until after the July days, however, was the provisional government forced to address itself to the problem of handling a major popular rebellion Appropriate procedures had to be established on a piecemeal, ad hoc basis. Within the cabinet, differences of opinion regarding which statutes of the Tsarist criminal code were applicable to the existing situation caused delays. Moreover, while the government had the good judgment to concentrate overall responsibility for investigating and prosecuting accused insurgents in the hands of a single authority, and as Kerensky, prosecutor of the Petrograd Court of Appeals. Several subordinate military and civil agencies were also necessarily involved. Coordination between these agencies was either very poor or non-existent. This caused further confusion and delay. Then too, it is well to remember that in the aftermath of the July days, the work of the provisional government and of its individual departments was especially disorganized. In retrospect, it is obvious that the government's most crucial problem, if it was to survive, was somehow to ease mass unrest and to deal decisively with the extreme left. But to the harried men of the provisional government, this was by no means apparent. As we have seen from July 2nd, when the first coalition collapsed, until July 23rd, when Kerensky finally succeeded in putting together a full cabinet, Russia was without a properly functioning government. It appeared that the Bolsheviks were permanently suppressed and most of Kerensky's time was understandably taken up by political discussions aimed at forming a new coalition and planning for the stabilization of the front. After all night negotiating sessions in the Winter Palace, Kerensky would leave Petrograd for Mogilev, Piskov, 
or some other frontline location to consult with his military commanders. During this period, individual ministers were shuffled from cabinet most or cabinet post to cabinet post like cards in a deck. This was the case in the Interior Ministry and the Ministry of Justice, the departments most intimately involved in proceedings relating to the affair of July 3rd to 5th. After Lvov's resignation on July 8th, Tseretelli became Interior Minister. On July 24th, he was replaced by Nikolai F. F. Oh, fuck. Agstensiev, who served until the end of August, when he too stepped down. At the Ministry of Justice, Ivan Efremov replaced the departed Perev, 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 fuck, Perevrezev on July 11th, and the cabinet and the cabinet announced on July 23rd, Alexander Zrudny became Minister of Justice. Zrudny was replaced by Pavel Malintovich on September 25th. The result of these continual ministerial changes was chaos. It could not have been otherwise. Meanwhile, public demands to do something about imprisoned leftists mounted from liberals and conservatives anxious to expose the Bolsheviks fully and without delay, and from socialists equally determined that the Bolsheviks be either properly indicted and tried or set free. Evidently, in the hope of silencing these critics, Krinsky, on July 21st, released a report on the progress of his inquiry. This report assigned exclusive blame for stimulating, organizing, and directing the July uprising to the Bolsheviks. As regards charges of espionage against the party, the report concluded that, among others, Lenin, Zinoviev, Kalantai, Sakharov, Raskolnikov, and Roshel had entered into an agreement with Russia's enemies to assist in the disorganization of the Russian army in the rear. For this purpose, with the money received from these states, they organized an armed insurrection against the existing order. In his report, Kerensky provided only the weakest circumstantial evidence to support these charges, making frequent allusions to more substantial proof, which could not then be made public. Predictably, the report triggered an outcry from the left. As Novea Zizin put it, it is difficult to understand why instead of an objective account of what happened, we get what amounts to an indictment. The conclusions do not follow from the premises. The portions of the report dealing with treason are so ambiguous and superficial, it is staggering to think that they could have been released by the prosecuting authority. In view of the tendentious nature of Kerensky's report, Martov recommended to the Central Executive Committee that the government be prevailed upon to permit arrested leftists to defend themselves during investigative proceedings. He also urged that an attempt be made to have representatives of the Central Executive Committee included in the government's commission of inquiry. A measure of the great upset triggered by Kerensky's action is the fact that despite dislike for the Bolsheviks and fundamental loyalty to the government, a majority of committee members immediately accepted both recommendations. They also adopted a public statement in which they strongly protested the publication of materials from the preliminary investigation of the July 3rd to 5th cases before the completion of the investigation and condemned this clear violation of the law. As an ominous sign that the new court system had inherited the worst features of the old Tsarist courts. Meanwhile, many of the jailed Bolsheviks had yet even to be formally questioned, and to workers and soldiers their plight became a cause célèbre. Whatever opportunity may have existed in the immediate aftermath of the July days to decisif decisively scandalize the Bolsheviks, and their cause quickly passed and the government was forced gradually to release those Bolsheviks in its hands. The overall ineffectiveness of the government's post-July days attempts to suppress and discredit the Bolsheviks becomes apparent when one examines the condition and activities of the Bolshevik Central, the Bolshevik, oh shit, the Bolshevik Central Committee, the Petersburg Committee, and the military organization during the second half of July and in early August. Of the nine-man Central Committee elected at the April Conference, for example, only Kamenev was behind bars. 
the necessity of remaining undercover put a severe crimp in the work of Lenin and Zinoviev. Still, neither was entirely lost to the party. Zinoviev maintained and indeed soon increased his journalistic endeavors, while Lenin, by means of frequent written dispatches from Razlev and Finland, continued to exert an influence on the formation of Bolshevik policy. Moreover, Joseph Stalin and Yakov Sverdlov, along with the Moscow leaders Felix Zerzinsky, Andrei Bubnov, Grigory Sokolnikov, and Nikolai Bukharin, all of whom were elected to the Central Committee at the end of July, filled the gap left by the absence of top Petrograd Bolshevik officials in jail or in hiding. Under the cool-headed leadership of Sverdlov, an, an indefatigable young administrator from the Urals who headed the party's secretariat, the Central Committee quietly set itself up for business in a modest apartment outside the center of town. In the mid-1920s, when public criticism of higher party organs was still tolerated, Ilin Zanevsky recalled the operation of the Central Committee in this period with undisguised nostalgia. Just about every day I used to go to Central Committee headquarters, and I frequently encountered a serene family scene. Everyone sits at the dining table and drinks tea. On the table, a large somovar steams cozily. L.R. Menzinskaya, one of the secretaries, a towel over her shoulder, rinses glasses, wipes them, and pours tea for each arriving comrade. Involuntarily, a comparison with the present headquarters of the Central Committee comes to mind. We have a gigantic building with a labyrinth of sections and subsections. Bustling about on every floor are an enormous number of employees, feverishly completing urgent tasks. Naturally, with its functions so expanded today, there is no possibility of the Central Committee operating in any other way. Still, there is a certain sadness in the fact that the time when simple and unpretentious yet profoundly comradely and united effort was possible, has gone and will never come again. During the first weeks following the July uprising, the closure of Pravda handicapped the Central Committee's work. Not until early August was it able to resume publication of a regular newspaper. Nonetheless, even in mid-July, while the reaction in Petrograd held full sway, Sverdlov felt confident enough of the future to to cable party committees in the provinces, that the mood in Peter Pitter is hale and hearty. We are keeping our heads, the organization is not destroyed. On July 13th, less than two weeks after the July uprising, the Central Committee managed to convene a secret two-day strategy conference in Petrograd, bringing together members of the Central Committee, officials of the military organization, and representatives of party committees from Petrograd and Moscow this meeting had as its central purpose the evaluation of changes in the political situation caused by the July uprising and formulation of appropriate tactical directives for the guidance of subordinate party organizations throughout Europe or throughout Russia. The conference's importance is attested to by the fact that Lenin prepared expressly for its consideration a set of theses on tactics in which he departed sharply from his pre-July tactical stance. In these theses, Lenin argued that the counter-revolution fully supported by the Mensheviks and SRs had managed to take full control of the government and the revolution. Not only the moderate socialist parties, but also the Soviet had become mere fig leaves of the counter-revolution. The perspective for the future outlined by Lenin flowed directly from this assessment of the prevailing situation. Now, the, now that the counter-revolution had consolidated itself and the Soviets were powerless, there was no longer in his estimation any possibility that the revolution might develop peacefully. The party's pre-July orientation toward transfer of power to the Soviets and the chief Bolshevik slogan, all power to the Soviets, had to be abandoned. The only tactical course left to the party was to prepare for an eventual armed uprising and transfer of power to the proletariat and poorer peasantry. In conversations with Ordzonikidze at this time, Lenin spoke of the possibility of a popular uprising by September or October 
and of the need to focus Bolshevik activity in the factory shop committees. The factory shop committees, Lenin is quoted by Ordzonikidze as saying, would have to become insurrectionary organs. In order to appreciate the response of participants in the July 13th to 14th Central Committee Conference to Lenin's directives, it is well to bear in mind the following factors. First, while there is evidence that by mid-June, i.e. prior to the July days, Lenin had given up whatever hope he may have had for the transfer of power to the Soviets without an armed struggle, it appears that he shared his views in this regard with only a very few closest associates. To the party at large, his efforts to prevent a premature uprising during the second half of June conveyed the impression that events had moderated its outlook. Thus, the ideas expressed in the theses came as a shot out of the blue. Second, the course now envisioned by Lenin inevitably reopened intra-party intra disputes over fundamental theoretical assumptions which had been prepared over at the April conference and which were to have been thrashed out at the approaching party congress. Finally, as we shall see, Lenin's assessment of the prevailing situation ran counter to the mood and views of many Bolshevik leaders, who, unlike Lenin, could evaluate the impact of the reaction personally and were in touch daily with leaders of left Menshevik and SR factions and the Petrograd masses generally. No official record of the deliberations of the Bolshevik leadership on July 13th to 14th has been published. From related contemporary documents, we know that Lenin's ideas were the subject of fierce debate. Volodarsky of the Petersburg Committee and Nogin and Rykov from Moscow took issue with Lenin on every key issue touched on in the, 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 in the theses. There's also evidence that Zinoviev, who was as vehemently opposed to Lenin's course as were Volodarsky, Nogin, and Rykov, but who was not at the conference, made his views known to the participants in writing. Sverdlov, Vyacheslav Molotov, Stalin's future foreign minister, who was then a dour-faced political activist in his mid-twenties, and Savaliev probably spearheaded the fight for the adoption of Lenin's course. When the theses were put to a vote, they were decisively rejected, 10 of the 15 party officials attending the conference voting against them. The basic differences in outlook between Lenin and the conference majority were reflected in the resolution that the con conf conferees went on to adopt in contrast to Lenin's view that the moderate socialists had completely sold out to the government and the state power was effectively in the hands of counter-revolutionary capitalists and large landowners, this resolution, while acknowledging that the Kerensky government was a, di was a dictatorship, implied that it was not yet fully under the thumb of the counter-revolution. According to the resolution, the dictatorship of Kerensky, Tsuritelli, and Efremov represented one the peasant petty bourgeoisie and the portion of the working class that had not yet become disillusioned with petty bourgeois democrats and two the bourgeois and land owning classes these two sides the resolution indicated were still engaged in bargaining with one another with regard to the mensheviks and srs the resolution stated that by their cowardice and betrayal of the proletariat they were constantly strengthening the position of classes hostile to the revolution but there was no suggestion that the Mensheviks and SRs were irretrievably lost to the revolutionary cause. In line with this view, the resolution was silent about the need to withdraw the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. Declaring simply that the Kerensky government was incapable of providing solutions to the basic problems of the revolution, the resolution pointed to the need for placing power in the hands of revolutionary, proletarian, and peasant Soviets, which would take decisive steps to end the war, but a stop to compromises, put a stop to compromises with the bourgeoisie, transfer land to the peasants, establish workers' control in industry and the distribution of goods, and destroy strongholds of the reaction. Subsequently, Volodarsky remembered that this qualification of the slogan, all power to the Soviets, was the only concession that he and his followers made to those who demanded that the slogan be scrapped altogether. 
The tasks of the party in the prevailing circumstances, the resolution stated, were to expose each and every sign of counter-revolution, effectively to criticize the reactionary policies of petty bourgeois leaders, to strengthen the position of the revolutionary proletariat and its party wherever possible, and to prepare the forces necessary for a decisive struggle to fulfill the Bolshevik program, if the development of the political crisis in the country permitted this on a genuinely mass scale. It was a formulation that could mean almost anything. The resolution said nothing about the end of the peaceful period in the development of the revolution, or about the need to prepare for an armed uprising. Implicit was the assumption that the party would continue to devote considerable attention to work in the Soviets. When the resolution is compared with the course Lenin was advocating, one of the things that emerges most distinctly is the reluctance of its authors to give up the hope of cooperating with other socialist elements to establish a Soviet government. This mood is also mirrored in the decision taken as the July 13th to 14th meeting adjourned to invite internationalists to participate in the coming party Congress with a con consultative vote and even to invite the SRs presumably, presumably to gain a sense of where they stood. When Lenin learned on July 15th what had transpired at the Central Committee Conference, he reacted with anger and alarm. The current situation was not unlike the one he had encountered at the time of his return to Russia in early April. Once again, he had to counteract a strong impulse within Bolshevik ranks to forego radical revolutionary action and to work closely, if not to merge, with, most, with more moderate political groups. Now, however, he was forced to reorient his party's policies from a remote hiding place 20 miles from Petrograd without benefit of a regular newspaper. Lenin responded to the rejection of his theses by the Central Committee conference in a long essay on slogans, pointedly observing at the outset of this essay that all too often in the past, when history has made a sharp turn, even progressive parties have been unable to ad adapt quickly to new situations and have repeated slogans that were valid before, but had now lost all meaning. He insisted that the slogan, all power to the Soviets, while valid during the period from February 27th to July 4th, had patently lost its usefulness after that date. Unless this is understood, he warned, it is impossible to understand anything about the urgent questions of the day. Lenin went on to suggest that the thinking of his adversaries in the party who believed that the SRs and Mensheviks might yet rectify their errors was childishly naive, if not simply stupid. The people must be told the whole truth, he insisted, namely that power is in the hands of a military clique of Kavanyaks. The power must be overthrown, he added. Soviets may appear in this revolution, but not the present Soviets. The present Soviets have failed. They are like sheep brought to the slaughterhouse, bleeding pitifully under the knife. Declaring toward the close of On Slogans that a new cycle in the class struggle is beginning, one that does not involve the old classes, old parties, and old Soviets, he insisted that the parties start looking forward instead of backward and operate with new post-July class and party categories. For the time being, however, Lenin was on the outside, looking in. The Central Committee Conference Resolution was the national leadership's main political evaluation, an official pronouncement on tactics between the April Conference and the 6th Congress. It was quickly reproduced as a leaflet, 340 bundles of which were rushed to subordinate Bolshevik organizations throughout the country. The resolution was duly published in each of the party's main provincial organs, and services and served as a guide for resolutions on the political situation and tactics adopted at pre-Congress party conferences and meetings that took place during the second half of July throughout Russia. The experience of the Bolshevik Petersburg Committee during this same period confirms that the damage done to the Bolsheviks during the reaction following the July days was comparatively superficial and easily overcome. Composed of close to 50 elected district committees, committee representatives 
who met weekly to discuss important policy issues. The Petersburg Committee was directed by a six-man executive commission, no members of which were arrested after the July days. The Petersburg Committee's work was momentarily thrown into disarray by the loss of offices and records in the Shezinskaya mansion. We lost just about everything, our documents, accounts, quarters, literally everything. A member of the executive commission dejectedly reported at the time. Still, contact between the commission and district party committees was never seriously disrupted. A temporary home for the Petersburg Committee was quickly found in the re relatively safe Viberg district, where as early as July 7th, party workers were turning out revolutionary leaflets on a dilapidated hand press left from SARS days. During the first weeks after the July uprising, the problem that seems to have troubled Petersburg Committee officials most was what effect the latest events, and particularly the charges of espionage against the top party leadership, would have on the Bolsheviks' influence and following among the Petrograd masses. An initial answer to this question came at the first full post-July days gathering of the Petersburg Committee on July 10th and at a session of the Second City Conference of Petrograd Bolsheviks on July 16th. The Second City Conference began on July 1st and was suspended on July 3rd because of the July uprising. The conference was resumed on July 16th. At both meetings, representatives from each district in the capital delivered personal reports on conditions in their areas. These reports indicated that among factory workers, resentment toward the party was limited from the outset, and in any case, it did not last long. More precisely, to judge by the reports of July 10th, employees of factories situ situated in relatively prosperous, not primarily industrial neighborhoods of the capital, seemed to be genuinely hostile to the Bolsheviks in the wake of the July days. In these areas, there were frequent instances of Bolsheviks being insulted by fellow workers and of their actually being hounded out of workshops. The representative of the Nevsky district, for one, termed the attitude of workers towards Bolsheviks their pogromist. According to him, better known party members were hunted. Moreover, offices belonging to the party were continually in danger of pillage by street crowds. The representative of the Parokovsky district, one of six Bolsheviks thrown out of his factory a day or two after the July days, complained of slanders against the Bolsheviks and of their being under surveillance. He stated quite bluntly that workers in his district were a stagnant swamp. Reviewing late developments in the Kolpinsky district, another speaker reported that the sympathy of workers there had turned away from the Bolsheviks as soon as the July demonstrations had ended. Lost my spot. These first-hand reports suggested that in addition to the engendering bitterness towards the Bolsheviks among undetermined numbers of Menshevik, SR, and non-affiliated workers, the July events seriously undermined the faith of at least some factory-level Bolshevik organizers in their own higher party leadership. Latsis of the Viberg district reported on one shocking sign of such a development at the Metalist factory. With almost 8,000 workers, this plant was among the largest industrial establishments in Petrograd. Before July, its flourishing 300-member collective had been a bright spot among Petrograd party organizations at the factory level. Latsis reported that after a military raid on the Metalist factory earlier that day, leaders of all political organizations represented there had gathered to discuss the latest developments. In the course of this discussion, Mensheviks and SRs had heaped blame on the Bolsheviks for having provoked the rise of the reaction. Under this pressure, the Bolsheviks present, present evidently swore to behave with greater restraint in the future. Worse yet, from the party's point of view, the medalist factory, Bolsheviks, adopted a formal resolution pledging support to the Soviet and placing their organization under the Soviet's full control. Immediately published in many papers, this remarkable resolution also demanded that the Bolshevik Central Committee 
and the Petersburg Committee divest themselves of authority and turn themselves into the courts to demonstrate publicly that 100,000 Bolshevik workers are not German agents. Such indications of shattered loyalty must have been profoundly disturbing to Petersburg Committee members. More significant, nonetheless, was that among party members, strong reactions to the July events, like the one at the Metalist factory, were quite rare. Indeed, judging, judging by the district reports of July 10th, Petersburg Committee members were, if anything, relieved that matters were not significantly worse. To be sure, those present agreed that the influx, influx of newcomers to the party had stopped. But the one development that all feared most, mass defections, had not materialized. A party organizer from Vasilevsky Island transmitted the news that while Bolsheviks and factories under his jurisdiction were sometimes attacked, there was no sign that these assaults were affecting the party's numerical strength. With obvious satisfaction, he also reported that SRs in one large factory had adopted a resolution in which they declared, if you arrest the Bolsheviks, go ahead and arrest us too. The representative of the Narva district, which contained the giant Putilov factory, insisted that pogromist agitation had an impact only in the most backward factories and that the street press is not believed. Latsis, in his report on the all-important Vyberg district, was similarly encouraging. There is no mass exodus from the party, he stated. Resignations are strictly of an individual character. He also indicated that in factories where workers had had an opportunity to assemble for political meetings, one could detect a desire for all revolutionary groups to pull together. At the second city conference on July 16th, the report from the Nevsky district was still dismal. Vasily Vinokurov related instances of individual Bolsheviks being beaten by fellow workers who wanted them to withdraw from the party. He noted that in his district, a patriotic pogromist anti-Bolshevik wave was still very much on the rise. Elsewhere, however, developments were significantly more encouraging. Speaking for the Executive Commission, Volodarsky was able to inform conference delegates that reports reaching us show that the spirit of workers is going everywhere. The spokesman for the Porokovsky district concluded that the pogromist mood there was already dwindling. As nearly as he could tell, flight from the party was limited to chance elements that don't even pay dues. A Narva district Bolshevik leader affirmed confidently that, that the spirit of factory workers was respectable and that work is progressing normally. The representative from Vasilevsky Island went so far as to term the mood of workers in his locale bright. He added that while some politically backward female workers are fearful, in other places the mood is even better than it was before the July days. As on July 10th, he noted that decreases in party strength were inconsequential, a slippage of 100 out of a total party membership of 4,000 in the district. On July 10th, the representative of the Petersburg district had reported the mood in his district as unstable. Now, despite the fact that the local Bolshevik committee was without a headquarters, the mood, he said, was good. The representative of the first city district proudly related that there were more people than usual at our last meeting. Latsis remained uneasy about the situation in the Metalist factory, but to him sentiment everywhere else in the Viberg district appeared to be swinging in the Bolsheviks' favour. He commented, If fewer people are entering the party, it is because our staff has been disorganised. Equally significant, he again suggested that in the face of attacks by the counter-revolution, Workers were exhibiting a desire to forget past differences in close political ranks. Apart from attempting to ascertain the effects of the July events on the stature of the party among the masses, delegates to the Second City Conference were most concerned about formulating an appropriate program of action for the future. With several of the most prominent Central Committee members temporarily unavailable, 
The obligation to present the Central Committee's position on this issue fell to Stalin, then 38 years old. Temperamental, coarse, and overbearing, an undistinguished theoretician, writer, and public speaker, Stalin was overshadow overshadowed as a revolutionary leader in 1917 by Lenin, Trotsky, and even Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Lunikarsky. This was probably the primary reason he was not sought by the government after the July uprising. Evidently, largely because of his Georgian background, Stalin was recognized as the party's leading authority on the nationalities question. On occasion, he also represented the Central Committee and the Executive Committee on the Petrogra of the Petrograd Soviet and in the Central Executive Committee. Apart from that, he seems to have spent most of his time assisting with the editing of Pravda and doing day-to-day -day administrative chores. Initially, Stalin's views on the development of the revolution corresponded closely to those of Kamenev, but after Lenin's return to Russia, he swung sharply leftward. By the middle, middle of June, he could be counted among the ultra-militants within the Bolshevik leadership. As a gesture of protest against cancellation of the June 10th demonstration, he, along with Smilga, submitted his resignation to the Central Committee. It was subsequently rejected. The honor of representing the Central Committee at the Second City Conference was a mixed blessing for Stalin since, as was soon apparent, the views embodied in the Central Committee Conference resolution described above did not fully represent his own thinking. His task was further complicated by the fact that some delegates were already aware of and sympathetic to Lenin's views on the prevailing situation and the appropriate course for the party, and anxious that they be given a hearing. In these circumstances, Stalin adopted an ambiguous, sometimes contradictory, middle-of-the-road tactical stance, unsatisfactory to practically everyone. Thus, in his main report on the current moment, using words that might have been borrowed from Lenin, Stalin announced that the peaceful period in the development of the revolution had ended, that the counter-revolution had emerged triumphant in the wake of the July days, and that the Central Executive Committee had aided and abetted this development, and was now powerless. In amplifying these statements, however, Stalin differed with Lenin in defining the triumph of the counter-revolution. He also departed from Lenin in his views on the nature and condition of the provisional government, the character and attitudes of the petty bourgeoisie, the significance of the July experience for the development of the revolution, and the prospects for the immediate future. According to Stalin, the provisional government was greatly influenced, but certainly not controlled, by the counter-revolution. The petty bourgeoisie still wavered between the Bolsheviks and the cadets. The political crisis of which the July days was a part had not ended. The country was engulfed in a period of sharp conflicts, clashes, and collisions, during which the immediate goal of workers and soldiers would remain the exclusion of capitalists from government and the creation of, of a petty bourgeois and proletarian democracy. In this situation, Stalin further explained the main job of the party would be to urge restraint fortitude and organization on the masses, to rebuild and strengthen Bolshevik organizations, and not to neglect activity in legal institutions. In short, while Lenin called on the party to break decisively with more moderate political groups and to point the masses toward an armed seizure of power independently of the Soviets, Stalin's main emphasis was on the need for restraint and consolidation. Yet, if in this sense his ideas were less than satisfactory to those sympathetic to Lenin's views, Stalin's statements regarding the triumph of the counter-revolution and the powerlessness of the Central Executive Committee, as well as his assertion that the immediate course of the revolution was bound to be violent, were understandably vexing to people sharing the outlook of the Central Committee Conference majority. Moreover, Second City Conference delegates across the board were apparently troubled by Stalin's failure to discuss the future of the Soviets, the foremost question on everyone's mind, and by his relatively passive view of the party's future political role among the masses. This predominantly negative reaction to Stalin's remarks was revealed during the heated debate that followed the speech. Taking part in this argument were, among others, S.D. Misklovsky, Vasily Ivanov, um, Moisey Karitanov, Gavril Weinberg, 
Vyacheslav Molotov, Anton Slutsky, and Maximilian Savaliev. Mislavsky began the discussion by inquiring to what extent the party ought to promote conflicts with the government and whether it would assume direction of armed protests in the future. To this, to this Stalin replied non-committally, we can expect that these actions will be armed and we must be ready for anything. Ivanov then asked what the party's attitude was toward the slogan, all power to the Soviets, implying that the slogan had reached a dead end. Pinned down, Stalin answered that, from now on, we speak the language of the class struggle, all power to the workers and poorer peasants who will pursue revolutionary politics. Kuritanov, a longtime Bolshevik and former emigre, criticized Stalin for not touching on the international situation as it affected the development of the revolution in Russia. We have been saying that if there is no revolution in the West, our cause is lost, he declared. Well, the West European revolution did not come to our aid in time, and our revolution could not expand further. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Kiritanov was not without optimism for the future. Scoffing at Stalin's suggestion that the counter-revolution was victorious in Petrograd, he insisted that from the time of the February Revolution there had been a gradual shift of power to the Soviets, which would continue. There were moments when he had to fear the dispersal of the Soviets, he said. Where we had to fear the dispersal of the Soviets, he said, referring to the days immediately preceding. But this time has definitely passed. He added, without the Soviets, our bourgeoisie would not be able to retain power for more than a few days. When his turn to speak came, Volodarsky seconded Karatinov's contention that Stalin exaggerated the strength of the counter-revolution. People who claim the counter-revolution is victorious are making judgments about the masses on the basis of their leaders. He explained, with both Stalin and Lenin in mind, while the top Menshevik SR leaders are shifting rightward, the masses are moving leftward. Kerensky, Tseretelli, and Av Av Avsensiv are caliphs for an hour. The petty bourgeoisie will swing to our side. Bearing this in mind, it is clear that the slogan, all power to the Soviets, is not obsolete, he concluded. Added Weinberg, the present government won't be able to do a thing about economic crisis. The Soviets and political parties will swing leftward. The majority of the democracy is grouped around the Soviets, and so rejecting the slogan, all power to the Soviets, can have very harmful consequences. Among those now venturing opinions on the current moment, Molotov, Savaliev, and Slutsky came closest to expressing Lenin's sentiments. Molotov insisted that before the latest events, the Soviets could have taken power without violence had they desired to do so. They didn't. Instead, the developments of July 3rd and 4th impelled the Soviets on a counter-revolutionary course. Power slipped out of the hands of the Soviet into the hands of the bourgeoisie. We can't fight for Soviets that have betrayed the proletariat. Our only solution lies in the struggle of the proletariat accompanied by those strata of the peasantry capable of following it. For his part, Slutsky chastised Volodarsky for shutting his eyes to the counter-revolution's great success. If we think of the term counter-revolution as meaning transfer of power to a specific group, a change in which the group previously in power can't get it back, he explained, then what we are witnessing is plainly the triumph of the counter-revolution. Obviously not completely familiar with Lenin's thinking, however, he added that no one is suggesting that we should simply throw away the all power to the Soviet slogan like worthless rubbish. At a time when the workers' revolution is expanding and the Soviets are struggling against it, contended Savaliev, the slogan all power to the Soviets just sows confusion. We have two choices, he declared. Either we expand the revolution or we stop. The party of the proletariat cannot stop. The winner will be up to history. The revolution goes on and we are headed for the final result, or final assault. After everyone wishing to do so had spoken out, Stalin read the resolution of the Central Committee Conference in its entirety. 
A proposal that a committee be established to revise the resolution as a whole failed by a narrow margin of three votes, after which the resolution was considered point by point. Early in this phase of the discussion, an unidentified delegate from the Viberg district requested to no avail that the chair read Lenin's theses. This despite the fact that copies of both the political situation and on slogans were in the possession of the chairman. As each point in the resolution was reached, one of the Leninists, either Molotov, Slutsky, or Savaliev, rose to propose amendments in line with the theses. Either because defending the Central Committee resolution was uncomfortable for Stalin, or because supporters of the resolution were dissatisfied with Stalin's earlier performance, Volodarsky rebutted these amendments. In response to a delegate's protest that Volodarsky had no right to the floor inasmuch as he had not been the main speaker, the chair ruled that Volodarsky represents the conference at which the resolution was originally adopted. At one point in the torrid parliamentary battle over amendments, after Slutsky tried unsuccessfully to insert a clause in the resolution declaring that the counter-revolution had triumphed, Volodarsky blurted out in exasperation, We are witnessing an attempt, at whatever the cost, to muscle through points that have already been rejected. The whole crux of our argument, i.e. with Lenin, is whether we are witnessing a temporary or a decisive victory of the counter-revolution retorted Savaliev. I sense a flippant attitude toward Lenin's theses here. All told, Molotov, Slutsky, and Savaliev introduced some 18 amendments to the resolution read by Stalin, all but one of which were rejected. As a result, in most respects, the resolution that the conference ultimately passed was a copy of the one adopted by the Central Committee Conference. The bitterness that the controversy over a, few, a new tactical course engendered at this time was revealed in the voting. 28 delegates came out in favor of the resolution, with three against and 28 abstentions. Justifying their abstentions, some delegates from the Muskowski district explained that they were not voting because of the inadequacy of the resolution. Molotov declared that he was abstaining because at such a crucial time, it is impossible to adopt a vague resolution. <clears throat> Finally, Viktor um, Narchuk, speaking for 11 delegates from the Viberg district, explained that his group had decided to abstain because the conference had not heard Lenin's theses and because the resolution was defended by someone other than the main speaker. The Bolshevik agency damaged most severely after the July uprising was undoubtedly the military organization. From the time of its formation, the military organization's chief purposes were to win the support of the soldiers of the Petrograd garrison and to organize them into a disciplined revolutionary force. By midsummer, considerable progress had been made in regard to the first objective. Several thousand soldiers had joined either the military organization itself or Club Pravda. Party cells had been established in most garrison units, and in several units, Bolshevik influence was paramount. Plans formulated by the government in the wake of the July days to disarm and dissolve Bolshevized regiments that had been actively involved in the uprising were only partially realized. Still, a high percentage of the party's most experienced and effective unit-level leaders were now jailed. The immensely popular Soldatskaya Pravda was silenced, and links between the military organization's top leadership and the troops were temporarily severed. Bolsheviks were effectively excluded from military barracks, and generally speaking, the party's operations in the garrison were all but halted. More markedly than in the case of workers, soldiers of the Petrograd garrison appear to have turned against the Bolsheviks after the July experience. This was probably in part because a relatively higher percentage of soldier Bolsheviks were undisciplined, politically inexperienced newcomers whose loyalties to the party were tenuous. In addition, however strong their desire for peace, soldiers tended to be more patriotic than workers and were consequently more likely to be swayed by the charge that the Bolsheviks were working for the Germans. Then too, as suggested earlier, garrison soldiers hoped 
not without foundation, that by repudiating the Bolsheviks, they might avoid transfer to the front. For these reasons, and probably for others as well, units of the garrison immediately after the July days often conducted their own political house cleaning, isolating known Bolsheviks from contact with troops, oh shit, and in some area in and in some cases turning them into the authorities. On July 10th, for example, at a meeting of soldiers' committees in the 1st Reserve Infantry Regiment, it was agreed to arrest leading Bolsheviks in the unit and to draw up a list of personnel guilty of making appeals for radical action. Presumably for use by the government, a formal resol- presumably by use but for use by the government. A formal resolution that these committees adopted two days later declared that chief responsibility for the behavior of the 1st Reserve Infantry Regiment on July 4th rested with the Bolsheviks, Vasily Sakharov and Ivan and Gavril Osipov, and a soldier of unknown party affiliation, Eliazar Slavkin. The resolution accused the four of carrying on dangerous agitation and making inflammatory speeches that hypnotized the troops. Moreover, on July 4th, they had allegedly committed a vile provocation by erroneously reporting that mass action had been authorized by the Soviet. At the same time, garrison units anxious to clear themselves of charges of involvement in the July days adopted fervent pledges of support to the government and the executive committees. Typical of such resolutions was one adopted at a mass meeting of soldiers from the Litovsky Guards Regiment on July 9th. Having consciously refrained from taking part in the armed movement of July 3rd and 4th, we condemn this action as dangerous and shameful to the revolutionary cause. We call on everyone to obey the firm will of the executive committees and the provisional government. We appeal to our garrison comrades to join their powerful voices to our resolution in so doing expressing the unified and conscious will of the garrison, which is directed toward defending liberty from attacks by German agents who are allied with counter-revolutionaries and who make use of the ignorance and backwardness of certain segments of the soldiers and worker masses. As if assaults by the authorities and harsh criticism by garrison soldiers were not enough, in mid-July, the military organization was also forced to endure attacks from, embi- from embittered elements within the Bolshevik party itself. Among top Bol- Bolshevik officials, the value of maintaining a distinct military arm had been the subject of continued controversy from the time that so- social democratic military organizations were first formed after the 1905 revolution. Supporters of military organizations contended that regular military forces were a key factor in every modern revolution. Moreover, they argued that the situation and concerns of soldiers and sailors differed so markedly from those of civilian elements of the population that military organizations possessing a great degree of autonomy and independence were an absolute necessity if the former were to be won to the side of the revolution, making possible its success. On the other hand, critics of military organizations argued that the potential cost of such organs in terms of duplication of effort and loss of control far outweighed whatever benefits might be derived from them. It is not surprising then that the apparent involvement of the Bolshevik military organization in the preparation of the July uprising without authorization from the Central Committee intensified criticism of the organization. Officials of the Petersburg Committee, as well as elements of the National Party leadership, evidently took part in these attacks on the military organization. Despite the danger of detection, Podvoisky, then sought by the authorities, was forced to appear and defend the military organization at the Second City Conference on July 16th and at the Sixth Party Congress on July 28th. Moreover, at the Sixth Congress, the military organization was the subject of a formal inquiry by a specially organized military section. Boris Boris. Shumatsky, a delegate to the 6th Congress from the Mid-Siberian Bureau of the Party and evidently a member of the section, subsequently related that at the Congress, Bukharin, Kamenev, and Trotsky, the last two presumably by written messages or through intermediaries, 
insisted on the necessity of dissolving the military organization on the grounds that it overlapped the work of regular party organs. According to Shumatsky, a majority of the military section rejected this position, acknowledging the necessity of maintaining a special military organization under the Central Committee. In the published materials in the 6th Congress, the debate and decision concerning the military organization's status are reflected in the military section's final communi communi com communique, which, among other things, announced the adoption of the following resolution by a vote of 8 to 4. Because of a whole series of peculiarities in living conditions and in professional and organizational matters pertaining to the existence and work of party members in the armed forces, this section sanctions the existence below the Central Committee under its constant and direct supervision of a special military organization to direct the everyday work of the party in the armed forces. Despite the authorities' active search for them, the military organization's most important officials, Nevsky and Podvoisky, managed to evade arrest following the July days. Although Podvoisky was twice detained by military patrols, he was able to conceal his identity. Nevsky, who had incurred a minor bullet wound in the leg during a shooting incident on July 4th, fled to the provinces. Shortly after Nevsky's return to Petrograd in mid-July, officials of the military organization, still at large, among them Podvoisky, Nevsky, Ilin Zanevsky, and Mikhail Kedrov, met secretly at the apartment of Genrik Yagoda to assess their losses and discuss future strategy. According to Ilin Zanevsky, participants in this meeting agreed for the time being to try to combine underground activity with legal work, that is, to maintain a central headquarters under cover and, as feasible, to resume open organization agitational activity among the troops. One of the goals set by military organization officials at this meeting was to resume, as quickly as possible, publication of a Bolshevik newspaper for soldiers, along the lines of the now illegal Soldatskaya Pravda. During the third week of July, Podvoisky finally found a press willing to produce such a paper, and the first issue appeared on July 23rd. The new organ, Robachi e Soldat, was to be edited by Podvoisky, Nevsky, and Elin Zanevsky, and managed by Kedrov and Yugoda. All appeared to be going well with the paper until complications arose at a Central Committee meeting on August 4th. This was the first meeting of the new Central Committee elected by the 6th Congress. Since the committee did not yet have a paper to replace Pravda, it decided to appropriate Robichi e Soldat. Moreover, obviously mindful of the organizational, organizational control problems experienced in June and July, it resolved that for the time being, neither the Petersburg Committee nor the military organization would be permitted to publish a separate paper. The Central Committee went on to stipulate that the editorial board of Robachi e Soldat would be composed of Stalin, Sokolnikov, and Militin from its own membership and one representative each from the military organization and the Petersburg Committee, subsequently designated as Podvoisky and Volodarsky, respectively. This arrangement was profoundly distasteful to military organization officials, who were accustomed to working on their own, very on their own, were jealous of their prerogatives and were convinced, as Podvoisky put it at the time, that a combined news organ could neither fulfill the objectives of the military organization nor meet the needs of the soldier masses among whom the military organization conducted propaganda and agitation. The fate of Robachi e Soldat was sealed on August 10th, when a particularly inflammatory editorial provided the provisional government with an excuse to shut down the paper. Hurriedly, the Central Committee now made new publishing arrangements. Without clearance from the Central Committee, the military organization did the same. Thus, on August 13th, for the first time since the July days, two Bolshevik papers, the Central Committee Proletary and the Military Organizations Soldat, appeared on Petrograd news newsstands. When the Central Committee got wind of the Military Organization's independent action, 
It determined to take over Soldat as well and directed Stalin to inform Podvoisky of this decision. Moreover, to prevent the military organization from embarking on further publishing ventures, Smilga was ordered to appropriate for use by the Central Committee funds in the military organization's possession that had been embarked for the publication of Rabochi e Soldat. Stalin and Smilga apparently carried out their duties with firmness and dispatch. For on August 16th, for on August 16th, the Central Committee received two sharply worded appeals from the military organization's All-Russian Bureau. The first appeal insisted on the military organization's right to publish a separate newspaper in terms which indicated that it would not be easy to get the military organization leaders to back down. The second protested the unprincipled way of violating the most elementary principles of party democracy in which Stalin and Smelga had dealt with the military organization and demanded that the Central Committee establish a more workable relationship with the Bureau of the military organization so that the latter may carry out its responsibilities. There's evidence that around this time the Central Committee established another special commission to inquire into the military organization's affairs, primarily with relation to the organization of the July Uprising and the publication of Rabashi e Soldat and Soldat. Indeed, Nevsky related that military organization leaders were now subjected to a party trial, during the course of which Bubnov, Zerzinsky, Menzinsky and Sverdlov were delegated to oversee various aspects of the military organization's activities. It is impossible to determine from existing evidence the relationship of this trial to the work of the military section of the 6th Congress. In any case, the military organization was evidently cleared of most charges against it, perhaps partly as a result of Lenin's intervention. Nevsky quotes Sverdlov as having told him that when Lenin learned that Sverdlov had been delegated to acquaint himself with the military organization, Lenin's advice was, to acquaint yourself is necessary. It is necessary to help them, but there should be no pressure and no reprimands. To the contrary, they should be supported. Those who don't take risks never win. Without defeats, there can be no victories. The published minutes of a meeting of the Central Committee on August 16th indicate that after listening to the military organization's two appeals, the committee reaffirmed the military organization's subordinate position within the party hierarchy, bluntly declaring that according to party statutes, the military organization could not exist as an independent political center. Yet having delivered this rebuke, the committee agreed to let the military organization continue publishing Soldat with the proviso that a member of the Central Committee with the right of veto be inclined uh, be included on its editorial board. Simultaneously, it delegated Sverdlov and Zerzinski to conduct discussions with the Military Organization Bureau to establish um, to establish shit, a proper relationship between it and the Central Committee and to keep tabs on Soldat. Sold that. Sold, I don't know. While the military organization leadership was fighting to preserve its status within the party organization, the Bolshevik position among soldiers of the garrison had improved considerably. Significantly, the regeneration of support for the party program that now occurred began in military units heretofore relatively free of Bolshevik influence. As Menzinskaya enthusiastically reported in a letter of July 17th from the Central Committee to the Moscow Region Bureau, the mood is shifting in our favor in those regiments in and around Peter, where up to now we have not had much success. Among soldiers, Kerensky's latest decrees, especially his reinstitution of the death penalty, have caused a terrible stir and explosion of hostility toward officers. Brief published summaries of post-July days meetings between high officials of the mil military organization and representatives of Bolshevik collectives in the Petrograd garrison confirm that government repression and the threat of counter-revolution helped the military organization overcome some of the worst effects of its unsuccessful insurrection by late July and the beginning of August. Delegate reports at the first of these gatherings on July 21st revealed that the events of early July had initially caused great confusion among the troops, 
and had adversely affected their attitudes toward Bolsheviks. At the next military organization meeting a week later, delegates remained dispirited and very much concerned about, pers about persecution of party members. Nonetheless, they were agreed that the negative impact of the July experience on soldiers who were sympathetic to Bolshevism was minimal. By August 5th, the same unit representatives were proudly describing mass meetings organized in the garrison to protest repression and the continued existence of the Duma and State Council. They also indicated that military organization membership was again on the increase. Finally, at the military organization meeting on August 12th, most unit representatives were of the mind that sympathy for the Bolshevik cause in the garrison was expanding even more rapidly than before. Apparently, some of them have averred candidly that this was the result less of military organization efforts than of the actions of the government and the moderate socialists. After hearing out these representatives, the military organization secretary recorded that the success of the Bolsheviks was due not to agitation, which is still difficult to conduct, but to new punishment regulations, the repression of revolutionary soldiers, and temporizing on the part of the defensists. The fact that repressive measures undertaken by the Kerensky administration had the entirely unintended effect of heightening popular suspicion of the government uh, and of impelling the Petrograd masses to put aside past political differences and to unite more closely in defense of the revolution is clearly reflected in numerous documents of the time. Among the richest and most valuable of these documents are the voluminous protocols and resolutions of the Petrograd District Soviets for 1917. As will be recalled, Soviets came into being in each district of the capital soon after the February Revolution. Often created upon the initiative of workers and soldiers themselves, these Soviets first sprang up in heavily industrial sections of the city. The Vyberg and Peterov district Soviets, for example, were founded during the February days. A local Soviet was formed in the Vasilevsky Island district in March. Subsequently, similar bodies were created in the central city, so that by the end of May, a network of over a dozen district and sub-district Soviets blanketed Petrograd and its environs. As in the case of the Petrograd Soviet, during the first period after the collapse of the Tsarist order, the strongest political groups in the district Soviets were the Mensheviks and SRs. Yet, in part because the majority socialist leadership on the national level did not attach much importance to work in such organs, the district Soviets were never dominated by middle-class intellectuals and political parties, as were the Petrograd Soviet and the All-Russian Executive Committees. Readily accessible to ordinary workers and soldiers, the district Soviets busied themselves mainly with immediate local concerns, such as food supply, the maintenance of public order, labor disputes, and social welfare, taking time to discuss only those broader national issues about which their constituencies were, were generally aroused. For these reasons, the proceedings of the district Soviets are a more reliable gauge of the shifting moods and concerns of the Petrograd masses than are the deliberations of the Petrograd Soviet or the All-Russian Executive Committees. One of the most striking observations that emerges from study of the district Soviets between late April and early August is the divergence that developed during this time between the political outlook of the district Soviets on the one hand and the central Soviet organs on the other. In mid-July, for example, when the All-Russian Executive Committees were pledging their unlimited support to the Kerensky regime, most district Soviets were becoming overwhelmingly suspicious of the government, increasingly exasperated with the temporizing of national Menshevik and SR leaders, and gradually more strongly attracted to the idea of creating a revolutionary Soviet government. Just as Volodarsky had argued at the Second City Conference, while the moderate socialist leadership shifted rightward, the masses were moving leftward. The divergence of views between the district Soviets and the national Soviet leadership, particularly the feeling of the former, that the Petrograd Soviet was not devoting enough attention to the concerns of the district Soviets, was reflected in the activation in mid-July and August of an organization known as the Inter-District Conference of Soviets. 
initially formed during the April crisis, but quiescent during most of June and the first half of July, the inter-district conference was an assembly of district Soviet representatives, two from each local Soviet in Petrograd, which met as the need arose to coordinate the activities of individual district Soviets and increasingly to bring the combined pressure of all district Soviets to bear on the central Soviet organs. A second feature that emerges from study of the Petrograd district Soviets during the summer of 1917 is the expanding influence within them of leftist groups, such as the Menshevik internationalists, the inter the inter-district committee, and the Bolsheviks. In April, for example, the Bolsheviks had been strongly influential only in the Vyberg and Kolpinsky district Soviets. Initially, a large majority of the interdistinct conference members were Mensheviks and SRs, and its first chairman was the Menshevik and Nisimov. By midsummer, however, in addition to the Vyberg and Kolpinsky district Soviets, the Vasilevsky Island, Kolomensky, and First City district Soviets, geographically scattered throughout the capital, were frequently passing Bolshevik sponsored resolutions. Nonetheless, with the possible exception of the Vyberg District Soviet, it appears that none of these Soviets were effectively controlled by the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks and SRs, more accurately, their Menshevik internationalist and left SR offshoots, retained influence in most district Soviets, at least until the late fall of 1917, and even those local Soviets in which the Bolsheviks had majorities preserved their essentially democratic character. In early August, a Menshevik internationalist, Alexander Gorin, was elected chairman of the Inter-District inter Conference. Under his direction, a compatible coalition of Bolsheviks, Menshevik internationalists, and left SRs steered the assembly along an independent revolutionary course. The protocols and resolutions of the Petrograd District Soviets lend support to the idea that immediately after the July days, anti-Bolshevik feeling on the part of workers and soldiers in some areas of the capital ran high. On July, t on July 13th, for instance, the Oktinsky District Soviet, located on the right bank of the Neva, adopted a resolution endorsing the condemnation of the Bolsheviks and the unqualified pledge of support to the government that the all-Russian executive committees had issued a few days earlier. At about the same time, the highly independent Rostevstensky Oh, sorry, Rostestvensky District Soviet, just across the river, passed a resolution declaring that the events of July 3rd and 4th forced the whole conscious organization, organized revolutionary democracy to fear for the fate of the Russian Revolution. An irresponsible minority injecting the uneducated masses with slogans abhorrent to the represent, re representative, representatives of the all-Russian democracy is unconsciously but definitely leading us to civil war. We declare that responsibility for the bloodshed on the streets of Petrograd on July 3rd to 4th falls completely on those irresponsibly, irresponsible persons and parties who consciously or unconsciously continually pursued politics that disorganized the force of the revolution. Apparently only the consistently militant Vyberg District Soviet attempted to buck the tide at this juncture publicly continuing to call for transfer of power to the Soviets and attempting to diffuse criticism of the Bolsheviks. For example, on July 7th, the day the All-Russian Executive Committees first endorsed repressions by the government, the Vyberg District Soviet defiantly insisted that the effective solution of the government crisis, the regulation of the shattered economy, and the promulgation of reforms were dependent on the transfer of power to the Soviets. What the relevant documents indicate most clearly is that, in the aftermath of the July uprising, most district Soviets were not interested in either condemning or defending the Bolsheviks. Their primary concern was with such matters as the government's effort to disarm workers and to transform radicalized soldiers from the capital. The reinstitution of capital punishment at the front, the apparently indiscriminate attacks on the left, and the resurgence of the extreme right each of these developments was perceived by almost every district Soviet as a serious threat to the revolution. The Inter-District Conference met for the first time in a month and a half on July 17th, partly to discuss the question of whether or not district Soviets should cooperate with the government in the campaign to confiscate arms 
from the population. This meeting opened with appeals by soldiers from the front that the deputies endorse this campaign in the interest of national defense. The soldiers added that they were all dedicated to defending the revolution and hence that their demands ought not be interpreted as hostile to workers. In response, a highly skeptical, skeptical deputy observed diplomatically that while workers might be willing to trust the composite detachment that had just arrived from the front, there was no way of predicting what might happen tomorrow. Workers had no assurance that someone else might not take advantage of their helplessness. Entire caches of arms are still in the hands of the Black Hundreds and nothing is being done about it. Another deputy interjected angrily at this point. Someone else then suggested that while workers might be prevailed upon to turn in machine guns, bombs, and perhaps even rifles, under no circumstances would they part with their revolvers. Ultimately, the conference effectively evaded cooperation with the government, and for all, all intents and purposes, evaded cooperation, oh, sorry, and for all intents and purposes, thwarted any significant coordinated effort by district Soviets to help disarm workers by voting to leave the matter up to discretion of each distinct district Soviet. A few district Soviets subsequently agreed to help disarm workers. On July 28th, for example, after listening to a plea for aid in procuring arms by Don Cossack, the Admiralty District Soviet passed a resolution declaring that military weapons were completely unnecessary for personal defense, and that in view of the government's frequent appeals, retaining them was a crime against liberty and the Russian army. However, there were almost no factories and few workers in the Admiralty District, an area in central Petrograd with numerous military administrative agencies and army barracks. District Soviets in heavily working class sections of the city, reflecting the mood of their constituencies, tended to view with the greatest suspicion the efforts of the government to confiscate weapons. Thus, on July 20th, after listening to some front representatives and discussing the arms question at length, the relatively moderate Petrograd District Soviet, while endorsing the turning in of rifles and machine guns, declared firmly that the confiscation of revolvers and sidearms would be considered a counter-revolutionary assault on the working class, which it would be necessary to oppose by every possible means. When the Peterov District Soviet considered the question of disarming workers on July 29th, deputies protested that it was not the workers who should be disarmed, but the counter-revolutionary and hooligan elements that have been shooting from rooftops and windows of houses, and that have come out openly and brazenly against the revolution and its triumphs. Obviously, the government would get little help from the Peterov Soviet in taking arms from workers. As nearly as one can tell, this was the position of all but a few district Soviets. One of the dear, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead a little. Provisional, the Provisional Government's restoration of the death penalty met with similar hostility from the District Soviets. Typifying the response to this step was the following declaration by the Rostevstensky Rostevs, Rostevs, fuck, Rostevstensky District Soviet, in which the Bolsheviks were still a small minority. One of the dearest victories of the great Russian Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the abolition of capital punishment, has been eliminated by a stroke of the provisional government's pen. In the name of saving the revolution, military courts, knowing only one sentence, execution, will be convened. Any soldiers des designated for the roles of executioners will hurriedly drag their worried, sick, condemned comrades, tormented by three years of slaughter, into an isolated corner and shoot them like dogs for no other reason than because they were unwilling to selflessly sacrifice their lives for their class enemies. The result is a gross absurdity. A free country has eliminated the death penalty for high-ranking criminals. All those Nikolai's, Sukom Sukomlanov's, Sturmer's, Prokopovich's, etc. The last three were former Tsarist ministers, but retains it for soldiers oppressed by three years of senseless carnage. It is a crime to kill tormented and desperate people crazed by recognition of the futility of their suffering 
and unable to see the end of this endless war. It is a crime to be silent about this reactionary, impulsive step by the provisional government against one of the most priceless triumphs of the revolution. Down with capital punishment, down with legalized murder, long live the Revolutionary International. At its meeting on July 17th, responding to scores of alarming reports of counter-revolutionary excesses in every district, the Inter-District Conference adopted a resolution declaring that unmistakable indications of an enlivened, actively organizing counter-revolutionary movement had been reflected in the events of July 3rd to 5th and the immediately succeeding days. The resolution called on the Petrograd Soviet to display energy and firmness in exposing counter-revolutionary cells and to insist that the government take decisive steps to combat the counter-revolution. It also demanded, among other things, a full investigation of all improper raids and arrests and the immediate release of political prisoners against whom substantial charges had not yet been made. One can easily imagine the dismay of district Soviet deputies Two days later, upon reading detailed press accounts of the Duma Provisional Committee's sensational meeting of July 18th, at an emergency session of the Inter-District uh, Conference on July 21st, 1st, 20, oh, 21st, 21st, every deputy taking the floor insisted on the immediate dissolution of the Provisional co Committee. Indeed, several speakers advocated immediate, concrete measures to ensure that this was accomplished. A spokesman for the Rostovsky <laughs> District Soviet, for one, proposed that the conference march en masse to the Tirida Palace in order to make their views known to the Central Exec Executive Committee. This suggestion was accepted with a proviso that in addition to demanding the dissolution of the Duma, the district Soviet deputies also insist on the restoration of full rights to democratic committees in the army, the rehabilitation of the leftist press, the halting of attempts to disarm workers, the immediate release of all political prisoners not yet charged with specific violations of the law, the prosecution of Pereshkovich and Masl Bas fuck, Maslenikov, rescission of the policy of breaking up regiments of the Petrograd garrison, and the immediate abolition of capital punishment at the front. At the same time, individual district Soviets responded to the pleas of Perishkovich and Maslenikov for liberal use of the noose against the left with, pro with protest declarations of their own. Typical of these public statements was the following one passed by unanimous vote in the Vyberg district Soviet. The Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies of the Vyberg District, having learned of the private meeting of members of the former state Duma and of their emergence on the national political arena, considers that the Duma, as an institution of the old autocratic system, is subject to immediate dissolution. The Soviet insists, insists that the provisional government issue a decree dissolving this counter-revolutionary institution and categorically protests against the Black Hundred Duma members who had the audacity to stand up and refer to revolutionary organs as a handful of fanatics, transients, and traitors. The Soviet demands a decisive struggle against counter-revolutionary elements, and in particular against former members of the State Duma, and believes that they should be made to stand trial for insulting the entire democracy represented by the Soviet. Significantly, by the end of July, even relatively moderate district Soviets were more concerned with consolidating all leftist groups, including the Bolshevik Party, in defense of the revolution, than with penalizing the Bolsheviks for their behavior weeks earlier. To formerly hostile deputies in the district Soviets, the Bolsheviks now appeared as, as simply the left flank of the revolution, which was threatened with destruction. The spirit of letting bygones be bygones and alarm in the face of the counter-revolution emerged at the Inter-District Conference's emergency meeting of July 21st. In a stirring appeal for the unification of all democratic forces to combat the advancing counter-revolution, Viktor Rapoport, a Menshevik internationalist, voiced the view that while the counter-revolution had begun with attacks on the Bolsheviks, blows against leftist groups close to the Bolsheviks could also be expected. The counter-revolution is mobilizing, Rapoport declared, and we cannot afford to dissipate our resources. 
Judging by their subsequent comments, most of the assembled district Soviet spokesmen shared this sentiment. A three-man committee, including one member of the Inter-District Committee, Menelusky, and two Menshevik internationalists, Gorin and Rapapur, was appointed to draw up a declaration on the counter-revolution and the existing political situation for consideration by each district Soviet, and ultimately for transmittal to the Central Executive Committee. In the document drawn up by this committee, the Inter-District Conference's first public statement on, board national, on broad national issues, the July uprising was characterized as a spontaneous act of military units and workers, the direct result of the political crisis partly caused by the cadets. According to the declaration, the counter-revolution had utilized the events of July 3rd to 4th for an open assault on the revolutionary democracy in general and its left flank in particular. Meanwhile, the post-July days persecution of the Bolsheviks had divided the forces of the revolution, isolating its left flank. The breakup of regiments loyal to the revolution, mass arrests, the destruction of the labor press had all served simply to weaken the revolutionary democracy. Expressing the opinion that, that another coalition government would lead only to a deepening of the existing political crisis and would open the doors more widely to the advancing counter-revolution, the declaration concluded that only a strong revolutionary government, composed exclusively of elements from the revolutionary democracy and conducting internal and foreign policies according to the program outlined by the Congress of Soviets, could save Russia and the revolution. Reflected in this declaration was the desire, articulated by Martov and the executive committees at this time, to unite all genuinely revolutionary elements in an exclusively socialist Soviet government which would combat the counter-revolution, pursue a meaningful reform program, and work for an immediate peace. This strong impulse to band together in defense of the revolution was also vividly expressed in a resolution supported by the Bolsheviks and passed on August 1st by deputies of the Narva District Soviet. In view of the extreme dangers threatening our country from both within and without, we believe that disorganization in the ranks of the revolutionary democracy is intolerable and harmful. Furthermore, we believe that all political groupings and multifarious shades of opinion come from above. The majority of those below don't understand, don't know, indeed can't even comprehend all of their disputes. We appeal to all who are participating in the common revolutionary struggle and who value our newly won freedom to respond to our call. We recommend that they rally around the Soviet of workers and soldiers deputies at the, as the highest organ of the democracy. We, repo we propose that those above find a common language so that united we can struggle against the enemies of the revolution.